Jeremiah chapter number 8. Going to begin reading verse number 21. Last two verses of the chapter. The prophet Jeremiah writes, For the hurt of the daughter of my people am I hurt. I am black. Astonishment has taken hold on me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? Now, we know, you know when I read this chapter from Jeremiah, I also think of the book of Lamentations where the prophet is so heartbroken because he sees the state of God's people. He says in verse number 21, For the hurt of the daughter of my people am I hurt. He says, these people are just like me. The only difference between me and them is that by the grace of God, Jeremiah did the will of God. It was his purpose to go and to tell a wicked Israel that if they didn't repent, judgment was coming. But even before the judgment came, okay, this is before the book of Lamentations. Lamentations is what the prophet sees after God poured out judgment on Israel. This is still in the warning phase. But as he's taking this message from God to God's people, he says, for the hurt of the daughter of my people am I hurt. He says, I am black. Now if you go and study that out throughout the Bible, it means one of two things. One, like the, you know, in the Song of Solomon, okay, the, between Solomon and the, uh, his future bride, she says, I am black, that she is not comely. That meant she had spent time in the sun laboring. Okay, that her skin was darkened. Okay, that's not what this is talking about. This, when it says that he is black, it means, you know, he is essentially dead. You know, it, it shook him, what he saw, the shock. And he says, why are God's people in this state? Right, it shook him to the core. He was saying his whole countenance changed. He was grieving as if he had lost a loved one. Right? That's how bad a shape God's people were in. He says, I looked at him and it looked like there was no hope. But then we get to verse number 22. It says, Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? He says, It looks like there's no hope, but I know that there's hope. He says, There's no reason for them to be in this state. He says, Is there no balm in Gilead? Right? Now, a lot of people talk about the balm of Gilead. You only find about two or three verses referring to it in the whole Bible. But, from what I've read, and don't know if this is true, okay, Gilead had certain properties, myrrhs and aloes and other sorts of, you know, material, that's what I'm looking for, where they could put together a balm or an ointment that would speed the recovery process. Now, I'm no genius, but even today, we still use aloe. Mostly whenever I'm too stubborn to put on suntan lotion and end up out in the sun longer than I thought I was going to be there. And I look about as red as Thad's shirt. Right? Aloe's very good then. Right? But what's that do? It takes the burn out of the sunburn. Okay? And, I mean, there are other things. I mean, a lot of the stuff that you take in a pill, it came from a plant originally. Okay? They just take it out of the plant and then put it into a pill. It's concentrated. Okay, well, Gilead was known as having an ointment. It wasn't a cure-all. Couldn't cure everything. But it would help the healing process. It kept infection out. It kept rot out. Okay, so, Jeremiah saying, is there no physician? Now, again, these are all rhetorical questions. The answer is, yeah. If they wanted to, they could have gotten help. His name's a great physician. Then he says, why then is the health of the daughter of my people, why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? He's saying they've got every opportunity to have things made right. Why don't people get things made right? They say they've got all the resources. They've got everything that they need. They've got people that God's given the intellect to help them. And he's speaking in literal terms. He's saying, if somebody were sick, wouldn't you go to a doctor? That's what he's asking them. So he's saying, why spiritually do people not go to the great physician and get things made right spiritually. He's saying, we believe in the balm of Gilead if y'all get sick. He says, God's got something a whole lot greater than the balm of Gilead for you. 
They're saying, if you believe in the physicians down in Gilead, why wouldn't you believe in the one that can take away all your problems? That's so, all. Actually, I had this uh, intended on teaching this last week. And by the way, I've got to get Brother Mike back. He called me long-winded. But I mean, at least I don't go falling down hills on golf courses. But, yeah. but intended on teaching this last week, and I've been mulling over it. So if we go a little bit over it, because i got about two weeks stored up. Not because not I'm long-winded. It's because you're going to get two. No, I'm just kidding. But I've been thinking about this for a while. And why don't people get help spiritually? In all seriousness, if God convicts you, shows you that there's a problem, why are people hesitant to go and say, Lord, take care of the problem? How come sometimes people go to the altar in all seriousness, in all sincerity, to get things made right, but then it doesn't get made right? We can go and look throughout Israel's history, and a lot of times people would go and they'd get things made right. But then sooner or later, you'd find them either in the same situation or in a worse situation. Israel has a history of coming to God in obedience and then rebelling against God, God sending a message, and then God sending judgment because Israel wasn't doing what God desired for His people to do. Why is that cycle not unbroken in God's people? We can go from the beginning of the book all the way to almost the end and you'll find people that were in or claimed that they were in and yet they fall out is there not a great physician is there not something that the Holy Ghost can apply to your life to help the healing process so why then do people not get healed as I started thinking about it it's pretty simple because sometimes healing hurts. Sometimes healing hurts. But with the help of the Lord, that's what we're going to teach on this morning. Some people don't get right because healing is going to hurt their ego. Now, whether that's pride or whether it's shame, something is wrong in the, as Brother Clint just prayed, get, Lord, give us perspective. Our perspective's off, it's askew. Either we think ourselves more than we ought to, which Robert tells me a haughty spirit goes before fall, or we're so ashamed of what we did that we can't face it before those that you know are God's people. But see, what they don't realize is, is that when somebody getting right with God, if they're a member of the family of God, right, if they've become a member of the called out assembly of believers, if they're not right, it hurts everybody. By our refusal to get things made right, we hurt others. Does not the Apostle Paul call us a body fitly framed together? Well, let me tell you, I had a problem in my back fixed, but uh, two days later, my hips knew that I had something done to my back. Right? My thighs knew that something was done to my back. Right? It fixed it. No more nerve pain. Hallelujah. Right? Today was the first day I drove to church and I can't remember where I didn't have pain shooting down my left leg. Right? Hallelujah. We're good. Still not 100%, but better than where I was. Right? But you don't realize how much you need your back muscles to walk until they're not there no more. Well, they were still there. They just got detached from everything that it used to be attached to. Right? Well, what I have to use, I had to use hip muscles that I haven't used since you know I used to lift weights for football. And I had to use thigh muscles that weren't used to being used in the way that they were now being used for. You know what the worst part was? They put these little things on my legs, I guess to keep me from getting blood clots or something, through the whole surgery. And it, it, they like filled up with air. Yet, well, the thing is, I had cramps in my calves for three days after the surgery. They put them things on like super mode or something. I don't know, but I mean, it's hard walking around. I was better, but I was also hurting. Right, well, my back was better, but for a while the legs had to take up the slack. Right, when I went to go get up out of chairs, I was having to use my arms to push myself up. Why? Because in order to fix something, temporarily, other things had to take up the slack. That's a bear you one of those burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And the body, it's a, they can handle it for a while. Right? 
not that way anymore. Granted, today might be the longest that I've stood up, you know, without sitting. So if I just go sit in one of these chairs, don't worry about it. I'll be okay. That, but getting better. I got can't walk outside because there's too much ice everywhere. I'm afraid I'm going to fall. So I just walk a lapse around the house. Getting a little bit better. A little bit better. But, well, that's the natural hit. But some people can't face either that they have a problem and their pride is hurt. Because of their pride, they won't admit that they need help. Israel thought they didn't need God. They thought that the gods that they were worshiping instead of God could handle their problems. They thought that they could handle their problems. They thought that the king would handle their problems. But yet the king of kings said, you got a problem, and they wouldn't admit it. Jeremiah preached, and it fell on deaf ears. Not because what he's saying wasn't, or wasn't true. Not because he preached it in the wrong spirit. He's heartbroken for him. He wants to help him. You can have somebody there, but I have the answer to your problem. But unless you humble yourself to realize I need what that person's offering, you're going to stay hurt. And let's be honest, it hurts to step off of your high horse or get off of that pillar that you're standing on and say, I was wrong. Some people don't want to face that hurt. That's why they stay sick. That's why whatever spiritual problem they're having is never resolved because they won't come to God and say, Lord, you're right and I'm wrong. The other people, it's the opposite issue. They know that they did wrong, but they're afraid to face it. They'd rather stay in a state of you know, misery and you know, essentially like the prodigal son, they'd rather stay in the hog pen than come back and say, you know what, I found out that I was wrong. They know that they're wrong. They just don't want to face the consequences of getting it made right. Most of the time they're wrong, by the way. The prodigal came back to the father's house. The father came and put the best robe on him, put the best ring on him. Didn't make him take a shower first. He came and he, he fell on him. He hugged him, kissed his neck, said, it's glad to have you back. But see, when you're in the hog pen, you can convince yourself of a whole lot of things. You think that it's going to hurt to come back and say, hey, I know I did wrong, but can we just, you know, not talk about it? Some people are so full of shame, their ego shattered. They don't think that they're worth anything in the eyes of God. Some people think that they're worth too much. Other people don't think that they're worth anything at all. But realistically, if we think about it, God thought that you were enough to send His only begotten Son for. But people aren't going to look, well, if people are right with God, they're not going to look down their nose at people judge people for where they're at. They want to help restore them to where they were. But see, some people can't get over the fact that they thought they could handle it, and when they faced it, it broke them. So they'd rather stay hurt than face people in the state that they're now in. I mean, it hurts to say, all right, I know I messed up. I know I've let people down. I may have broken promises, right? I may have hurt people, but today we're going to go get it made right. right? That can hurt because you've got to face what you did. But the beauty of it is that when restored, it's forgotten. My sins are gone, right? Not pushed back, not, you know, put into a category where, well, God's going to check on it again and see if I've kept up the mind. No, 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 gone. He remembers them no more. So God's people should be just the same. We restore, which means we get rid of what was there and we get them back to where they were. Right? Never to be. That's what forgiveness means. Most of the time, people don't apologize 490 times. But God told Peter, Jesus told Peter, right, forgive somebody 70 times 7. Somebody wrong you that many times in the day, if he come and ask to get it made right, you forgive them. If they're sincere, you forgive it, which means you forget what they did before. So if they do wrong and they come again, I don't remember the last time you did me wrong. If you're sincere about getting it right, I'll forgive you this time. Thankfully, God's that way. Once it's made right, He forgets it. But see, we don't think in those terms when we're down on ourselves and we're beating ourselves up when we're in the pig pen. Right, and it hurts for people to get the 
courage to face what they had done and admit what they've become so they don't get right. Okay, but second, sometimes people just don't get right because healing hurts because sometimes a root has to be ripped out. Now the Bible talks about the root of bitterness, but there's a lot of things that can take root in your life that it's going to hurt to have that thing taken out. Now we've already alluded to this, but we'll, we'll get there in a second. Okay, the root of bitterness, as the apostle wrote about, right? It takes God to remove it. We can't remove it. It takes an act of God to remove the root of bitterness. Because if I get it, I'm going to miss something. It's still going to be festering down in there. So just follow me here for a second. I've been thinking about this for a while. I've got to get you all up to speed. Okay? If something's taking root and you get all of it, right, when it comes out, there's a void. Wherever that thing was, it's empty there. Okay, now, if bitterness is in our life, it doesn't just make a new space for itself. What's it do? Well, it digs into things like love and joy and faith and peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, temperance. Right? Other things have to go away to make room for whatever's taking root in our life. We become anemic so that whatever's not, whatever wasn't supposed to be in our life can now grow. Right? Think of it this way. The new man has to get weaker so that whatever's taking root in our life can get stronger. Now vice versa. If we want to increase our spirituality, the new man must grow stronger so the old man must die. He must get weaker. Right? That's why Jesus said, can I serve two masters? You're either growing in one way or you're growing in the other. But whichever direction it is, something's dying. Something isn't as strong as it used to be. Now, if it's the flesh, that's a good thing. But if anything takes root in our heart, it doesn't have to be bitterness. Right? I would lump you know, jealousy and all them. Th I'd root, lump that in with bitterness and that root of bitterness because if you're jealous, it's because you're bitter about what you got. Okay, There's a lot of things that we can lump into bitterness. Okay, But what about anger. The Bible says be angry and sin not. The root of wrath. Right? What about I mean just going down the root of unforgiveness. We just talked about that. Right? If you have an unforgiving heart right? that's something that God wants to pluck out of you. And it may be the case that God may have to go in and take a sharp two-edged sword and cut down to the root in order to take the root out. I don't know about you, but when preaching starts getting to where I'm living, it hurts a little bit. But the hurt is worth it if you get it made right. But I'll tell you this. They woke me up. Didn't have nerve pain. Only pain I could feel was it felt like I got stabbed in the back, which I didn't get stabbed in the back. They very delicately faced me open. But they were like, how's your pain level? And I said, well, which one? And they said, what do you mean? I said, leg pain, zero. They said, well, what's the other pain? I said, it feels like I got stabbed in the back. And they're like, that's normal. I said, okay. It may hurt a little bit, but that hurt's going to go away a whole lot quicker than the pain that I had before. That wasn't ever going away. Now, that was only going to get worse and compound. Well, some people think that well, in order to get it made right, to get this root taken out, it's going to hurt more than the root hurts. No, no, no. Because whatever keeps you at enmity from what God wants you to be, Brother Mike last week taught on during Sunday school, being in the perfect will of God, anything that keeps you from being in the perfect will of God, that's doing more harm than you than you even can consider. That has everlasting, eternal ramifications. Right? You'll have to stand before God and give an account of why you didn't let God remove that root from your heart. You'll have to face those that you could have witnessed to but because of whatever was growing in our heart, we didn't. Whether it was a root of fear, what's that? That's just a lack of faith. Right? Doubt. Again, faith. Right? All these roots that can take place in our life, well, if God removes it, there's a vacuum there. It may hurt to have it taken out, but like I just said before, if it's gone, the thing that you've been using, that you've been relying on, that's not there no more. In fact, that's what rooted means. It's become a part of you. 
And if God removes it from you, there's something there that you used to rely on. And other things have become anemic. So it's going to hurt for a little bit to use that faith that you haven't used in a while. Not because it's hard to use faith, but because that's a muscle that you haven't used in a while. It's like them hip muscles that I forgot that I had. I'm not kidding. That was, besides the, cr the cramps on my calves, my hips were the sore thing. I was like, forget the back pain. Right? Why are my hips hurt? And because I realized, because in order to move forward, I was having to use my hip muscles. Couldn't use my back muscles. I couldn't walk heel to toe, because if I did that, when the heel hit the ground, the back muscles hurt. I was walking around on tippy toes for the first couple of days. You say, well, that looked weird. Well, yeah, I was having to use different muscles than I was used to use them. But as that void started to heal, right, that vacuum of, well, that strength that I once had, you'll find it again in the things of God. But for a while, it hurt a little bit. But I can tell you, hip, perfectly fine. All right, leg muscles, we're doing good. Finally, them goofy cramps went away after about the day three, and I was like, hallelujah. I was like, but I'm, that was not going to lie, might have been the worst part. Calf cramps. You say, why? Because you don't realize how much you need your calves until you can't use them. Especially when you can't use your back muscles, too. Well, what am I saying? That vacuum that's formed, people are so afraid of not having that thing. Because it's become a part of them. They don't want to give it up. Right? All of that can be resolved in this thing called lordship where you just let him be lord and let him lead. If I don't need it, Lord, take it. If I do need it, Lord, give me the grace to hold on to it. I want to be whatever you want me to be. But some people are so afraid of losing or they'll let God cut it out. They'll get the root of bitterness out and then when they realize how anemic they are, they get scared. They're afraid to face the growth. Growing hurts. Anybody remember growing pains? I used to get them so bad that I'd wake up in the middle of the night wondering what in the world was going on. I felt like Jeremiah. It felt like there was a fire shut up in my bones. Only it wasn't God. It was just growing. Right? Improvement requires effort. And if you're already behind the ball because you've become anemic, it may hurt a little bit. You know why my hips hurt? Because I hadn't used them in about 10 years. If they'd have been strong already, hips wouldn't hurt. But if there's a root, it means that something's had to die to make room for that root. And people are afraid of... We'll get to it. Now, we'll save that for the end. See, like I said, been thinking about this too much. But a uh, third thing, sometimes people don't get better. And sometimes the reason that healing hurts is because you've still got to deal with the flesh. Now let me elaborate here. Oh, I don't know. Twelve years ago? Eleven years ago, somewhere in there? I had my wisdom teeth cut out. Okay, they went to go put me under. They said count backwards from 100. I don't remember getting to 98. But they said that I kept counting down into the 80s. So they gave me a second bag of anesthesia. I was out. But they were like, he's still talking. So they gave me another bag of anesthesia. We only found out about that when the bill for the second bag of anesthesia showed up in the house. Right? Well, I told the anesthesiologist this time, I said, I've only dealt with it one time. It may have been a fluke. I just want you to know, last time I had to have anesthesia, they needed to give me more than what they thought that they needed to give me. Because I, like, I was out, but I wasn't all the way out. Okay. Well, guess what happens this time around? They go to put me under. I was just in the middle of the conversation with the anesthesia. Next thing I know, I woke up in post-op. Okay. He cheated me. He didn't give me a warning. But they put me out. But I wasn't all the way out. So they went to go put the breathing tube in to intubate, intubate me. And guess what happened? Unconscious Jordan, that wasn't asleep, started fighting them and was like, no, you're not putting whatever that is down my throat. 
Okay? Like, I was just, you know, resisting. I wasn't really, like, throwing punches. But they were like, hey, we got to give them more anesthesia. Well, hey, you know, I had a few nicks in my mouth where I was, like, really thrashing, I guess, and I'm like, uh-uh, you're not, like, I can understand that. If I was awake, I don't think I'd enjoy having the tube put down my throat either. Right? But I wasn't consciously making that decision. Okay, I told the guy in post up, can you send a note to the nurses and say, I'm sorry for fighting them. I didn't know that I was fighting them. He said, no, it, happened. it, it, it happens every now and then. But I warned them. I was like, hey, just so you know, they didn't believe me. Well, they still had to end up giving me more anesthesia. Well, because I was a fighting them, and they use this little thing to depress your tongue so that they can get the tube down your throat, that thing nicked up the inside of my mouth. Had a few of them right here on the back of my lip. And then the worst one, all the way back by my back molar, got me right in the gum. That sucker still hurts if I eat something salty. I forgot about it. I stabbed it today, brushing my teeth. Ooh. That still hurts. But see, I didn't make that decision. That was something that happened because the unconscious part of me, the old man, the flesh, was fighting what God was... I was all in. They were like, hey, your blood pressure's fine. Your heart rate's, like, really low. I was like, yeah. We're good. Everybody told me, you're the best patient we've had all day. Well, thank you, except for the part where they knocked me out and I decided to fight them, but... I was all in. Didn't have any... God gave me peace on it. Hey, let's do it. But just because... I made the decision that we're going to get this made right. Doesn't mean that the flesh made the same decision. Sometimes people come to the altar and say, Lord, I want to get this made right. They're sincere. They're earnest. They want to get it made right. But the flesh is going to fight them the whole way. And they may get a little nicked up. The flesh may reach out and try and grab a hold of something that's going to hurt them. Right? But because of that pain people say well it's just not worth it I can't do it well greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world in fact we're more than conquerors through Christ he made us a king in the book of Revelation to rule and reign over this body it's possible but if people have a spiritual unhealthiness right, if they're ill that means that the flesh might be stronger than the inner man not because it should be, but because we haven't done our job. We've got to rely on God to give us the strength to get us through. That takes some enduring. Not against the world, but against yourself. That takes more than a little bit of willpower. That takes a little bit of prayer power. That takes a little bit of... When I know that, Lord, I'm about ready to give in, I just start praying and asking God for help because I don't know what to do. I got myself in the situation. Lord, show me how to get out of it. Right? Why do you think he puts a song on our heart? So that when we least feel like it, we can start singing about the one that we love the most to remind us that there's something worth overcoming for. But see, some people just think, well, because I made the decision to get things made right, everything's going to be hunky-dory now. I thought everything's going to be good too until I woke up. It's funny. I woke up and post off. I was still a little woo. First thing I remember is this lady saying, oh my gosh, is your lips swollen? Or are your lips normally that big? And I just looked right at her and I said, ma'am, I've had people tell me that I have black people lips. And then she just looked, okay. And then just walked away. You say, what, what was that? She thought that the cuts on the back of my lip were the reason my lips were, no, it's dad's fault. I got them from him. Okay. But she said, oh my gosh, you're and then she said, well, hang on, are your lips torn? They knew that I'd been fighting, and I just wanted to make sure that when they put me under that I didn't wake up with a lip that was going to be, you know, out to here. She said, I was going to go get you ice or something. I said, no, nah, I think I'm all right. It may have hurt for a little bit. In fact, somebody, I think it said, bought me a basket of stuff, had some peanuts in there. And I think Brother Brian and them got me some cashews. I like peanuts and cashews. Couldn't eat them for a long time because I had three cuts in my mouth that every time I ate salt, it burned. 
Uh, there are things that, well, if you get something made right with God, the things that you used to like, you're not going to be able to enjoy them anymore. They're going to hurt. They're going to cause you pain. Your flesh is going to want to reach out and crave for them. But because you've tried to make something right with it, it's going to keep trying to keep that wound open so that it keeps hurting, so that you quit. Right now that we're here, we'll talk about that balm of Gilead. The balm of Gilead didn't cure anything. The balm of Gilead didn't take the illness and just miraculously take it away. What it did was it allowed the body to heal itself without any other complications getting in, involved in the situation. Right? It would clean a wound out, but it wouldn't take the wound away. It didn't take pain away, but it helped healing so that it would happen quicker so that the pain would be gone. Right? It may have soothed something that, you know, I don't know why, it, it didn't, but in my head, my back was scratched like itchy the whole time that I had that, you know, all the bandages and everything on it that I had to keep the little plastic thing over and all that. But I wanted to scratch it, but there, it really wasn't itchy. It was just something that I wanted. But if I did that, I could have tore the whole thing open, and then I'd have to go back in and get more stitches done. Right? Your flesh is going to want you to do the exact thing that's going to keep you from healing. Well, that's what the bone of Gilead's a picture of. God intervening, stepping in, and allowing us to heal if we ask Him to help us. God's got a way. It's the same for everybody. Not just for salvation, but for spirituality. In order to have greater faith, you've got to exercise your faith. <coughs> right? In order to have patience, you've got to go through things that test your patience. Isn't that right, Brother Randy? I still think of you every time I think of patience. I used to teach my Sunday school. But Job didn't just have the patience of Job because he was Job. He had patience because God had worked, through, worked patience into his life. Right, well, how do you get patience like Job? You've got to go through everything that Job did before. He had that day that was the worst day in his life. Well, you've got to live Job's life like he had before that so that you can have Job's patience when the worst day in your life comes. Right, well, how do people... Get so good at praising God. They practiced. But we said we, people go home and they practice shouting. No, but they just practice telling God how much He loves them, and eventually they figure out the best way to do it. And then when they, they start praising God, after they figure out how to start praising God, well, how's that in spirit and in truth? Right, perfect transparency, and just adoring God not for what we get out of it, but because He deserves it. Then you find that God starts listening to their praise a little bit more. Why? Because it's sincere. It's honest. They've practiced that muscle. Well, if you've got a wound, something that wasn't there needs to work itself back in. I knew a guy one time, tore his bicep, weightlifting. It, it, it looked weird. It was bad. You couldn't even see it. It was just all on their skin, but you looked at it, mm, something not right there. You know what had to happen? That muscle had to put itself back together. He couldn't use it for a while. But as it started putting itself back together, you know what he had to do? He had to start working it again. Using it again. And he said it hurt. He was having to reteach his arm muscle how to be an arm muscle. Because it had been split in half. The balm of Gilead doesn't put the muscle back together for you. But it'll take some of that pain out. Just like uh, Icy Hot. I see how it doesn't cause the, you know, solve the problem, but it'll get rid of some of the inflammation. It'll loosen up the muscles for you a little bit. God could miraculously say, boom, here's faith. But if he did that, we wouldn't appreciate it. If somebody gave you something, would you take as good a care of it as you, know, you worked for it? We can't earn anything from God, but we can labor in the Lord's work. And it can be a labor of love. And that love is developed because you've invested in it. We love Him, but we also love His work. He put something in us. That was the great mystery that the Apostle Paul talked about. That He would put a treasure in earthen vessels like us. Us. Just dirt. Yet He put His Son in us. 
put himself in us so that we could go out and be a light to others. You see, people don't think about that. People just think, well, in order to get this solved, it's going to hurt. Yeah, but it's going to hurt to leave it there as it is. Any hurt that comes from healing is temporary. Because at the end of healing is healed. You may look back and say, well, I'm not 100% to where I was. Well, no, but now that you're healed, you can start working back towards it. I'm under no illusions that I'm going to be running marathons anytime soon. But hey, before I had this, when I was in the best shape of my life, I wasn't running marathons. Okay, I'm not comparing myself to that. Not looking at Usain Bolt and saying, hey, I'm going to see you at the next Olympics. Not going to happen. In the same vein, I know I'm not perfect. I don't get in here and start comparing myself to other people throughout the Bible. One, I don't know, I may know some of their life, but I don't know the day of the day. Of the, I can't judge that person not having walked in their shoes. I know what messes me up. You want a good picture of what ego should be like? The Apostle Paul. First he said, before I got saved, I was the chiefest of sinners. He said, I was the worst. Well, the Bible says that if a man is guilty in one part of the law, he's guilty of all the law. You know what that means? I was just as wicked as he was. But then after he gets saved, he says that some days he does the things that he ought not do, even though he does, you know, he desires not to do them. And then other days he desires to do the right thing, and then he can't do it. But then he says that some days he does do the thing that God wants him to do. You know what that tells me? The guy that was the apostle to the Gentiles, he knew that he needed just as much help as anybody else. You know why God used him to do so much? He let God help him do it. He said, Lord, there may be pain. In fact, he found out that God's grace was sufficient for the, his thorn in the flesh. That God's strength was made perfect in our weakness. I'm very weak. In fact, you know, a week and two days ago, I was, I was very, very, very weak. Now, it is a struggle to get up out of a chair, let alone roll up out of bed. But I don't know how, but I woke up, had surgery on Wednesday, woke up Thursday morning about 4 a.m. I was half on the bed, half on the nightstand, and about ready to fall out of the bed. No idea how I got there. Just woke up like that. And then I heard footsteps upstairs, and I grabbed my phone with my left hand and said, Hey, Mom, that wouldn't happen to be you walking around upstairs. And she goes, Yeah, why? I said, I have found myself in quite a predicament. I couldn't even get myself out of the situation that I somehow, when I was asleep, got myself into. What are you saying? Knowing that you need help is not a bad thing. In fact, knowing that we are weak is the beginning of our strength in the Lord. But some people don't want to admit that they're weak. Other people don't want to face that they're weak. Humility is knowing where you're strong and where you're weak and asking the Lord to help you where you're weak. And then by faith, using your strengths to do what God wants you to do. It's knowing who you are. But I wasn't walking around with nerve pain down my leg convinced myself that that was normal. But I knew that something was wrong. And we tried everything in the book. You know, get it made right. didn't work. Okay, let's get it fixed. People were... People, you're having back surgery? Yeah, and it's going to solve the problem. It'll be okay. they treating it like the end of the world. You have to go to the hospital. Yeah, it's okay. That's where they do surgeries. If they wanted me to do it in a shed somewhere, I'd have said no. Right? But some people so afraid of what they have to go through. I promise you this, it's going to be a whole lot easier to go through it with the Lord than it's going to be to stay where you're at on your own. But yet, sometimes it hurts to heal, but eventually the hurt's taken away. You are made whole. It may take time, it may take effort, and it may not be enjoyable, but in the end, it'll be worth it. In fact, the thing that I'm not looking forward to, he wants to send me to physical therapy. I've had to do that before. Don't like it. 
but mostly I don't like it because they sent me there before for back problems and it didn't fix the back problem. That's what I, that may be a like a, a grudge that I it may be unjustified is what I'm trying to say. But that's just in my mind that's how mm -mm. that wasn't that wasn't fun. But because I think of physical therapy, I think of pain. It didn't take the pain away; it caused more pain. But see, this time around, the goal is to take away the lack of strength that I've developed because I couldn't use back muscles for a while. In fact, found this an inter interesting statistic. They say somebody that's even completely healthy, if all they do is lay in bed all day, they can lose up to 1% of their total strength in just one day. 1% of their muscle mass. Perfectly healthy, but if they just lay in bed, they say that for elderly people that may have osteoporosis and other problems that they can lose up to 5% of their strength a day. You say, well, what are you saying? Not doing anything about it is causing a whole lot more problems than we think that it is. Indecision sometimes is what ends up being the straw that broke the camel's back. For you can make up your mind, it gets so worse that now you have to do something. But before where it wouldn't have been as much effort to fix. Now it's gotten a whole lot worse. In fact, you know why they made me get up and walk around, walk laps around the house? Because they didn't want me getting blood clots. Didn't think that that was a problem. They checked my cholesterol and everything beforehand. I'm good. But he said, no, 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 it's, it's a product of the anesthesia being under, laying in one position for so long that around the wound there will be blood clots where it's trying to stop the flow of blood and then it'll just travel to different parts of your body but if you get up and move the blood clots can't form you'll be okay alright let's get up and walk laps around the house champs just follow me around and staring at me like what are you doing in fact Tay and Christian brought me over one of them little grabber thingies you, you squeeze it and then it's got the claw at the end because it couldn't bend over and after two days of champ just sitting there staring at me wanting to play I can't get down in the floor and play with you right now and I'd like get one toy and then I'd throw it and then he didn't want that one and I'm like no I can't bend down and get a different one well with the grabber I could and if I dropped something I didn't have to call Sydney who was working from home upstairs Sydney can you come get my phone I dropped it in the floor right if you're serious about getting it you may think well I'm just going to be a burden on other people you'll find a way around it if you're serious about it enough God will give you the means to do it if you're serious about doing it he'll give you the balm of Gilead but it's still going to take some fixing it's going to take effort nobody promised that it would be easy if it's easy being spiritual then everybody be spiritual if it was easy following God's will discerning what God's will was and then living it everybody being God's will but just because it's not easy doesn't mean it's not worth having in fact it's the most precious thing that you have is your spirituality because God gave it to you and entrusted it to you and didn't just suggest no he instructed he commanded that we be good stewards of what God put into us that we be the one that when he gave us one talent we come back and say Lord I made ten or Lord I made five he didn't say how much fruit to bear he just said go and bear much fruit in fact, Jeremiah, though we don't have record of one convert, he bore much fruit for the Lord. Where the world, or maybe even himself sometimes, when he threw in the towel, well, he said, I won't, I'm not going to prophesy, I'm not going to teach, I'm not going to preach in his name anymore. He got to thinking about it while he's in prison. And you know what he came to the determination of? God never did me wrong. I'll just keep doing what he wanted me to do. The more he thought about it, the more reasons he found that he should do what God wanted him to do. He had a little bit of a problem, but he said, Lord, take it away. And you never find that that problem ever affected him again. He got it made right. Not saying that if you get something made right today, you won't have something to get made right tomorrow. But I'm saying that if you're sincere about getting it made right, it may not be enjoyable to admit that you were wrong or 
to grow back your faith to where it once was, to let God pluck them things out of your life that have become so much a part of you that you resist letting them go. They'd be painful. But it'll be worth it in the end. Because what you don't realize is that those people that don't get those things made right, they're in more spiritual pain than they could ever you know, quantify. In fact, sometimes they don't even realize that they're losing sleep. But the Bible says that because some wouldn't do the will of God, God put them in the grave. That there's much sickness among God's people because they were disobedient. That you do reap what you sow. And by not getting it made right, you're sowing a lot of things that you're not going to enjoy reaping. I'd rather take the temporary pain than the long-term pain. So let's get it made right. Let's get it addressed. Healing may hurt, but once it's healed, it don't hurt no more. Leaving it the way it is, it's going to hurt for the rest of your life. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.